Velocity uh, selectors are basically a piece of apparatus which can be used in other things. One place where it pops up is in a mass spectrometer, which you might have learned in chemistry, and it's just a device that can be used to identify elements that you have in a substance. What does a velocity selector do? Well, basically, as we'll see uh, in this video, is it will select particles, charged particles, depending on their velocity and some other factors as well. The way it does this is it uses the effects or it uses the um, forces created by the magnetic and electric field. And it tries to balance those, as we'll see in a second. What is the structure of a velocity selector? Well, it exists of two parallel plates, one positive, one negative. What this will do is create an electric field between these two plates. And as we know, this is going to be uniform because those plates are positive. Remember, I'm showing it's uniform by making them equally spaced and I'm, uh, they're parallel to each other and the direction is positive to negative. So red equals the electric field. Now, what do we do? Well, what we now do is put a charged particle into this. We also create a magnetic field. In this case, I'm going to create it such that the magnetic field is going into the page. And then we represent that by a circle with a cross. And we'll make sure this uniform throughout. So the blue is the magnetic field. The symbol B going, in this case, into page. Remember, the cross means it's going into the page. Now, let's put our charged particle into here. Let's make it a positive charge. But you could have either. And think about what happens when it enters this region over here. So when it's out here, it's not going to experience any force because it's uh, not um, in the electric or magnetic field. But when it enters, and this has a velocity, so it's accelerated up using some charged plates and it has a velocity, then it enters this velocity selector region. Let's now consider what the forces will be when it's over here. For ease, I'm going to remove that bit of magnetic field there, but it obviously is there. Now, first of all, let's think about the electric field, which I'm going to show with red. Well, which way is this going to move? Well, remember the, the electric field shows direction of positive charge will move in, or just think it's going to be attracted towards the negative plate at the bottom. Remember, this is all negative here. This one is positive, where it will be repelled from. So we can see that the force due to the electric field will be down. So this is force due to electric field. I'm going to write it like that. Now, to find the direction of the force due to the magnetic field, we need to use Fleming's left-hand rule. Now remember, the direction it's moving in is to the right. So if you use Fleming's left-hand rule, the current finger going to the right, the magnetic field is coming going into the page, so that's your um, first finger going down, and that gives your thumb pointing upwards. So this tells us the force due to the magnetic field, which I'll write FB, is upwards. Now if those two balance, then we know that this trajectory of this particle is going to be in a straight line. And this is how a velocity selector works, because there's a small gap here, behind it a detector and what it does is it then detects whether the particles have made it out. Let's look at it now at a slightly neater sketch of this um, and it is the same example as we've just done up there. You can see the charged particle entering a velocity selector here. Let's think a bit about the mass now. The force due to the magnetic field, remember is the force on the charged particle, it's BQV. Remember there is also sine theta but because theta in this case is 90 degrees, i.e. the direction of motion v is at right angles to the magnetic field, because that's going into the page, this becomes 1. Sine of 90 is 1. So we know f equals bqv. So we can see that if v were to increase, we would speed this particle up, then the magnetic force would increase, and it would curve upwards, and it would miss the little hole here and not make the detector. If v was to decrease, I'll show it with a red line, that means the electric field force will be large, well, stay the same size, but the magnetic force, because V has gone down, will also go down. So the force upwards has gone down. This has got smaller, so therefore it would hit over here and not make it out. Now, let's think about this ma more mathematically as well by looking at how this relates to the force due to the electric field. Now, remember from the equation E equals F over Q, where E is the electric field strength, and F is the force, and Q is the charge. So rearrange that, we know that Q, sorry, F equals E times Q. Sorry, my Qs go different ways depending on what mood I'm in. Now for this to make it 
well, continue in a straight line and make it to the detector through that little gap, these two have to be equal. So we know that B Q V equals E Q. We see the Q's cancel, leaving us with B V equals E. Don't remember this, uh, don't forget, sorry, that this V is velocity. V equals velocity, not voltage. That's why I've written it in small. Rearrange this to get V equals, we get V equals E over B. But remember, this is a uniform field, so we know that E equals V over D. That's the equation you learned in AS. Um, and if we substitute that in, we get V, or velocity, is equal to voltage over BD. And because this is not obvious enough, I'm going to put this in red and make it smaller. So it's clear that this is velocity, and this is voltage here. So this tells us, basically, what voltage and what B and what D will give us the desired velocity for it to go straight and come out the other side. Some of you might be saying, well, what about the weight of this acting down? Well, the good news is that the weight is so small. So weight, very small, and it can therefore be ignored. I mean, you could include it, but it'll be so small, it'll make no difference to your um, calculation. So weight or the gravitational force is ignored. So just some other images to show you this idea here. Again, you can use your, pause the video and use your left hand to check this. A positive charge moving to the right field going up, and as we can see, if, when the velocity is just right, is equal to E divided by B, then it continues off straight, and it would be detected over here. Otherwise, it's going to curve off if that's not equal. There's also a nice image here, which again, you can pause and read it in more detail if you'd like to. You can now see below the two syllabus statements this video is looking at. We've explained the first one, how electric and magnetic fields can be used in a velocity selector, which is shown in the image above. The second one asks you to explain the main principles of determining V, which is the velocity, and E over M for an electron, where E is the charge of an electron. Now let's look at this V for an electron first of all. Well, that's quite easy. Just imagine that we use electrons as the accelerating particle. As we found earlier, V is equal to E over B. So what we could do is fire some electrons in. Remember, we need to accelerate them up. The way we can do that is using some charged plates. If an electron comes in here, this one is negative and this one's positive, it's going to accelerate up towards this plate and then it can be fired out and onwards. When it enters the velocity selector then, we can adjust E and B until we detect the electron over here. Once we do that, we can just use this equation Remembering that V here is velocity. And we can find, therefore, the velocity of those electrons from a velocity selector. But how can we find E over M? Let's look at that now in more detail. Bear in mind that E over M is sometimes called the charge to mass ratio. Why? Well, E is the charge of the electron. And you can imagine that was very important to find out, sorry, of the electron. It was very important to find out back in the um, past. We now know it because it's on a formula sheet, but how did it get there? Well, by doing some cool experiments. And this is the mass of the electron. And this ratio is important because once they had this ratio, they then went on to determine the individual values by using other experiments. So what Thompson, who was the person who first investigated this, did J.J. Um, Thompson in 1897. What he did was he used something called an electron gun, and that is as cool as it sounds. It's in here. What it does is it just accelerates electrons up. They then leave the gun, and they are in a magnetic field, which is labelled here. And it's created by these coils of wire, which can be changed to change the strength of the magnetic field. And it's a nice uniform field. And that electron's going to experience a force. You can use Fleming's left-hand rule to find the direction. Though in this case, you don't know the direction of the magnetic field, so you couldn't do it. But as we can see from the loop, it's clearly centred towards this circle. It's always right angles to the motion, so it creates centripetal force, so you can get the electron to go around in a circle. How's that useful? Well, first of all, let's have a look at it over here. Here it is in real life. You can see this is an evacuated. This is a vacuum, because otherwise the electrons would stop. Um, you can't see the thing, well, no, you can just there, the coil of wire creating a magnetic field which passes through this bowl. There's a gas in, uh, sorry, I said this was a vacuum. There is actually a small amount of gas, which basically glows 
when the electron collides with it. And that's what you can see here. Now, a couple of initial observations by Thompson. First one being, he observed that these charged particles were attracted to a positive plate or charge. And what does that tell you? Well, that tells you the charge is a negative. He also noticed that the loop did not spread out. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that there's only one particle there, which must have the same mass, charge, and speed. Because if it didn't, as we found earlier in the velocity selector, that would cause it to bend by different amounts. And rather than having a nice tight curl, you can't see it so much in that image because that wasn't done very well, but the one above you can. If we if they weren't all the same, what would happen? Well, it spread out and would kind of have this sort of effect here where this all kind of glows like that. So there were two early deductions, but how do you find the charge to mass ratio, which is what we're interested in? Well, if we think about it, that's going around in a circle. So that tells us there's a centripetal force, which is equal to mv squared over r, as we remember from the last topic. Now, what's creating that force? Well, it's the magnetic field on that charged electron, which is equal to bqv. Now, we're interested in the, in the charge to mass ratio. So if I rearrange this, to get charge over mass. Now let's take the B and the V over the other side. So we'll have V squared, excuse me, V squared over R, B, V. The V is gonna cancel, so we're gonna be left with Q over M equals V over B, R. So this is how Thompson was able to find the charge to mass ratio. But this is charge, which we can give the symbol E because it's the charge of an electron. This is the mass of the electron. This is the mass of the charged particle moving. V is the velocity, which could be found using the velocity selector equation earlier because it relies on the magnetic and the electric field, which we know. B was known because they could control that in the experiment. And R is the radius of the circle of charged particles. So this distance here, which could be measured with a ruler. So this was how Thompson um, approached this problem of finding the charge to mass ratio of an electron. So just a quick reminder, he fired electrons into this um, glass uh, sphere, had a gas which glowed so they could see the path of the electrons. They used a magnetic field to make the electrons curve round in a circle, as you can see over here. Then using a bit of clever maths, as um, shown down here by equating the centripetal force to the magnetic um, the force created on the charged particle due to the magnetic field we're able to get this equation here really you just need to, be able to describe the experiment that was done which is this idea here um, in your exam thanks for watching let me know if you have any questions